going to talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're headed as a church, and I'm pretty excited about that because this year, so many great things have happened. I don't know if you remember all the way back to all-night prayer meeting at the beginning of the year. That was amazing. 123 people stayed all night till 7 a.m. and praying for God to do something awesome in this year, and this year has just seemed to me to be progressing in a, in a way that is, it, people are growing and they're experiencing the life of God like, like we haven't in a, seen in a while. And I'm pretty excited. We measure things around here. Services continue to grow. We grow numerically. We're growing financially. But one of the most important things that we want to measure is people's lives changing. And that's why we measure water baptisms. 95 people so far this year have been baptized, which is a number we're celebrating because that those are 95 people who decided they're going to make a public declaration of faith. And that is so significant. That's why we're here in this region. That's why we're here planting churches. We have a vision to plant at least 10 campuses in this region. And the reason for that is we want everybody who's part of one chapel, to live the gospel out in their neighborhood. It's called a family of neighborhood churches. And we want them to, the vision is to own the ground that you live on, that you own your neighborhood, that you will be the person who will be the light. You will be the person who will be the one who serves in people that are in need. And that you think like that and you become attentive to who, who, who you live with and who lives around you. And when we do that as one chapel, what happens is you get so many people doing that in one local community and suddenly a church will sprout up. That's exactly what happened at Liberty Hill which we're going to launch our fourth campus at Liberty Hill on the 29th of September. It's going to be a great Sunday. We are, we are launching that sucker no matter what the building looks like. It, it doesn't matter what's going on there. We're going to put some chairs out and we're going to have church. And so, um, so I, I think it's important for you to understand things are moving and progressing. And I want to talk about that idea today. Because I don't want you to get left behind. We're actually, we're actually seeking out and searching for new venues for Austin and for uh, Kyle. Um, and, and there's, there's, so there's a lot of things that are sort of in our future that God wants us to do. And I, I just thought it would be important today to talk about a few of these ideas. There's going to be um, some, some series that we're going to go into this fall that I want you to think about owning the responsibility to bring somebody with you to church. Now, we have a thing around here, two out of 52. Say it with me, two out of 52. Now, 50 Sundays a year, you could just come to church, but there needs to be at least two Sundays that you go through the nerve-wracking dynamic the adventure factor of bringing somebody with you to church and they're sitting right next to you. You know what happens when you do that? You pray more. (laughs) You're more attentive to what the ushers do. You're more aware of my message because you're praying for me. Pastor Ross, don't blow it. Don't say weird stuff. (laughs) And I want all of us to lean in. I want us to lean in as a lifestyle, and I think you need a couple of Sundays a year where you do that. And so we're doing two series. One's called Overwhelmed. It launches next Sunday. We're going to go for several weeks, and we're going to touch the idea of how overwhelmed we are in this culture. We're going to talk about anxiety. Next week, we'll talk about anxiety. Next week after that, we'll, we'll, t- we'll kind of talk about depression. We'll talk about stress. We will have a mental health expert kind of join us for one Sunday where we, where we talk about some really challenging ideas that are going on in our culture. And then we're gonna, uh, the, we'll finish up with talking about the dark night of the soul. And so there's going to be a real opportunity for people who are wrestling and struggling and, um, and needing to know that it's okay to talk about these things. And so uh, pray about who you might bring to church with you. And then... Later on in the fall, we're going to do something called that we do every year called feature presentation. 
And feature presentation is a fantastic series where we take movies and we, and we, we unpack the biblical ideas in those movies. We, we take the best storytelling that we have in our culture, and then we tell the story of the gospel with it. And uh, it's really fun. We're going to do four movies uh, this fall. Uh, do you want to know what they are? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm going to tell you what they are. We're, we're going to do, the, the, this year is the 10-year anniversary of the movie Up. Yes. So what's really fun is, we, this is this is one of our first movies that we ever did in the life of our church in the movie theater at Barton Creek Square Mall. We did we did the movie Up, and it's, it is a heartbreaker, but it is all about purpose and meaning and family. And then we're going to do a movie called Instant Family. If you've seen that, it's a, kind of a recent one. It's a, it's a fantastic movie. Then we're going to do uh, Avengers Endgame. Oh, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so much fun. And then we are going to finish up near Christmas with the Christmas classic, A Christmas Story. Red Rider BB Guns. And so it's going to be so good. And so uh, pray about who you might bring to church over the next few weeks and into the fall. And um, I, I think it's important for, for all of us to understand that we've got to move, move forward and move towards Jesus. We have this saying around here, we help people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. You know what's so great about this phrase? It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for years and years, there's more for you. There's more for you to learn. There's more ways to grow. There, you can get closer to God. There's more to unpack about who he is because he is infinite and he is a creator and he loves you deeply and there's more of his love to discover. And, but, but at the same time, if you're just maybe even investigating the claims of Jesus or you're just new to this faith thing, we want to help you take steps. We want to help you move towards him. And regardless of where you are on the spectrum, we can all move towards God. And here's the, here's the idea behind movement. People get stuck. They just get stuck. They get stuck because they get hurt. They get stuck spiritually. They get stuck emotionally. They, they get stuck physically. Something happens to them. They, they, they get stuck in doubt. They get stuck in discouragement. They get stuck in all kinds of ways. All of us do. And we need help to get unstuck, to move. And this idea of moving is so significant because think about it. Physically, if you don't move, if you stop moving around physically, what happens? That's right. You get weak and you get lazy. You stop going to the gym, you stop exercising, you stop walking three miles a day, you stop doing, and you just sit around at work on your tush, staring at a, staring at a computer, eating a donut. What happens? You get weak. You get lazy. And the weird thing is, you lose your motivation. You lose your motivation. Like, like but spiritually... It's exactly the same. Spiritually, it's the same. If you stop moving spiritually, if you stop growing, if you, if you stop moving towards the next thing, you'll get weak spiritually. And weirdly enough, you get lazy. You stop having a motivation to go further. And then the enemy lies to you and says, oh, you'll, it'll never work. I mean, this is how Amy and I deal with our physical exercise, we start about every three weeks. <laughs> but the lie is that you can't start again. That's a lie. You could start anytime you want to. So we live it out. <laughs> and then once you start going and you do three weeks, you start going, hey, I can do this. I start getting, this is awesome. This, I love this. This is like my motivation is back. And that tells you everything you need to know about me. <laughs> Three weeks is about all we get. <laughs> this idea of moving is really important because when you think about it, Jesus, all through the gospel message, he encourages and challenges his disciples to act to move, to serve, 
to share, to feed, to heal, to help, to love, to go. He's always drawing them out because when you follow Jesus, you step into a story that is so much bigger than your own. You step into a story that is bigger than yourself. And, you, and this is something we all crave. We want to be so, part of something bigger. Anybody go to the Texas LSU game last night? Yeah. Or, yeah. It was a, it was a, this was a big deal game. I, I, was, I was texting with one of my pastor friends who loves LSU, went, went to school there, and I was texting him right at the end of the game, fourth quarter, and I'm like, are you watching this comeback? <laughs> and then the pass from Burroughs, I can't remember who caught it, but they scored again in the fourth quarter, and he's like, no, I'm watching LSU win the game. <laughs> The tickets yesterday for that game started at $400. Individual tickets up to $3,000. Why, why do people pay $3,000? I could take my whole family to Australia on that. Why do, people, why do people pay that much money to do that? Because they want to be part of something big. They want to be part of something that's beyond themselves, something that's going on around them that they want to say, I was there. This morning, they don't want to say that, but yeah, they were there. <laughs> and that's cool, man. I love football. Like, I'm total football guy. Like, I'm so excited about the NFL starting. Like, it, this, this is, it's going to be a great season. And here's the thing. Football's one thing, but what you and I are called to it's much greater. It's much bigger. What we're called to do as one chapel is farther beyond what we can even really conceive is what the Bible says. And so I want to challenge you today to think about the big story that you're involved in here at One Chapel. It has eternal significance. You're part of something that's big where you want to, I want you to, I want your life to be transformed for sure. But you know what I want more than that? I want not only your life to be transformed, I want you to turn around and focus on another person and walk with them and hold their hand and see their lives transformed. That's what we're called to do. And we've been doing this for nine years. Today is the nine year anniversary of One Chapel. We've been trying to influence local communities all over this region, and there's more for us to do, and I'm so excited about it. We made a little video that I want you to watch and to kind of tell this story about how we're all moving towards Jesus. Thank you. 
Listen, whether you're a native of Austin or you're a transplant like me, we live in an awesome city. God loves this city. He has an incredible plan for this city, this region. Don't think it's an accident that tens of thousands of people are moving here every year. Don't complain about the traffic. God has a purpose. Don't, don't whine about all the inconveniences. You don't think it's just economics that's causing this to happen. God has a plan, and we're part of that plan. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about God's purpose and plan for every one of us. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for your word. Now as we open it up, would you give light and life to our hearts and mobilize us, motivate us, encourage us, challenge us, convict us to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians 1, 28 through 29 is the scripture we're going to jump from today and talk about this idea of moving forward. And I think there are four steps that every person, four steps that every Christian must go through. They're hanging on the wall over here. We're going to unpack them today. Colossians 1, 28, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to the believers at Colossae, and he says, he is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone. Everybody say everyone. everyone. That we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want to highlight four steps that are, I think, locked inside this little passage. And I want you to get them. The first step is to experience God. God wants you to know him. He wants you to experience him. He wants you to understand who he is. Now, I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says in this verse. He says, he is the one we proclaim. Who is he? It is Jesus. I unapologetically proclaim to you, One Chapel, we are a Jesus church. Amen. This is about Jesus. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, the Trinity is this amazing relational entity that has called you and me into relationship with him. But Jesus was sent to the earth for a very special purpose and plan. He is the central character throughout the entire scriptural record. He is the one that helps us understand who God is is. He's the one we're talking about. He's the one we're preaching. We're not preaching ourselves. We're not preaching one chapel. We're not preaching our beliefs even or our skills. We're not even really just preaching the scripture because the scriptures are supposed to reveal Jesus. It's easy to settle for religion instead of relationship. It's easy to go through the scriptures and just get into some kind of legalism rather than to see the life that's in it. We wouldn't be the first people to make that mistake. It happened to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. John 5, 39 through 40. It's his Jesus, and Jesus is saying this to the religious leaders who are rejecting him. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. They wanted to believe the scriptures, but they didn't want to believe in Jesus. Listen, we have to understand that our faith is not about an outcome or this some thing that we've got to see happen. It is about a person, and his name is Jesus. It is about following him. And Jesus is the way that we experience God through the Holy Spirit. When we say, Jesus, come into my heart, right? Like, it's kind of, that's a kind of a phrase. Jesus, just come into my heart. We're not talking about a little miniature Jesus. 
We're not talking about a little pet or a little trinket or a little token. Oh, Jesus, he's like so nice. Jesus is way bigger than that. He's more amazing than that. He's everything. But what we mean by that is by the work of God's spirit, Jesus inhabits us. That happens by a Holy Spirit process. That's an experience you have to have. And this is the thing about this experience. It, 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 there, it is ne necessarily an experience you need to continue to engage with because Jesus is leading you somewhere. We're following him by the work of God's spirit, his spirit that lives within us. Colossians 1.15 says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You know what this means? This means Jesus is God's selfie. Jesus is the picture. He's the illustration, what he did, the miracles, the relationship, the love, the compassion. This is who God is. Jesus shows us who God is and what a relationship with God is all about. And not only that, but it, when, he, when he shows us this picture in who Jesus is, he's showing us that he wants to be with us with us. He, he doesn't want to be distant. He wants to be connected. He, in fact, he wants to be united with him. And that's a miracle. That's a supernatural idea. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us when he left the earth. He came and he, and he took the sins of the whole world upon himself on a cross and he died and he closed the gap that was evident between humanity and God himself. And he pulled all of us to himself and to his father and to the Holy Spirit. But, but what happened was Jesus said, I'm going to send you somebody else. I'm leaving you, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit so that you can have my presence. In John 14, 26, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Did you know you can read the Bible and not learn a thing? Lots of people have. Lots of seminary professors. Lots of people try. You got to have God's spirit working in you to reveal what the words actually say yeah. and what they mean. And so he says, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You know why the Holy Spirit does that? Because we forget what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit is God's presence here on the earth, and he's active, and he's working. Presence is one of the three values that we talk about a lot, presence, relationship, and mission. Presence is kind of this weird word, but here's what we mean by it. What we mean is God is present and active among us. He's active among us. He's not distant. He's not passive. He's relational, and he's dynamic. God is always trying to move near people. He's always trying to draw them close to him, not farther away. And that's what weekend services are kind of all about. We, these weekend services, we're, we're about cultivating God's presence within us as we worship together, as we share the scriptures, because we forget. And when you come and you worship together, there's something dynamic that happens in the room. There, there's a reminder. It's like, hey, don't forget, God is active He's working. He's with you. He's not against you. He's for you. He's, he's present and he's active at your workplace. We just had a whole series about that. God is present and active at your school. He's present and active in your home. And once you start believing that, everything changes. You start thinking differently. You're attentive to, you start, you start becoming suspicious. God, are you doing something? And the answer is, yes. He is doing something. That's what we're doing here on the weekend. We're reminding each other that this is true so that when we leave this place, we don't act like the presence stayed here. His presence goes with you. 
His presence lives with you. Christianity is not about mental ascent or just following the teachings of Jesus because they're nice ideas. Every Christian has a moment where they are born again, where there is a supernatural rebirth, a spiritual birthing process where they have an experience that continues over and over again because there's more to know, there's more to love, there's more that to be revealed of who God is. It's an endless journey that we're on. You got to experience God. It's the first really important step. If you skip that if you skip that step, it's really hard <laughs> to go to the next step, which is find freedom. Now, I wish, I wish that when you came to God for the very first time and you're like, okay, God, I'm going to let you in, in to have your way in my life. I'm going to surrender everything. I wish that at that moment, all your problems were solved. Sadly, they're not. There is one thing in all the Bible that is instantaneous. One thing that happens immediately, it's forgiveness in response to repentance. When you turn away from yourself and you turn toward God, the immediate response is forgiveness. You sin, you don't have to do penance, just repent. Forgiveness is immediate. It is immediate. You don't have to go along and try to prove to God that you're okay, that you'll be a good boy or a good girl. No, forgiveness is immediate. That's the gospel. Sadly, I must report that everything else is process. <laughs> everything else takes time, energy, willingness, surrender, yielding. Everything else is growth and movement. This is why this finding freedom idea is so important because people come to Christ with really messed up lives. We're all messed up. We all have wounded yesterdays. We all have issues, and some of us are packing a lot of luggage when we come to Jesus because we think we're moving in with all that stuff. <laughs> but there's a big process where Jesus begins to unload it for you. And, 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 and sometimes there's this mindset, oh, I, I have to get all cleaned up and I have to get all ready to give myself to God. No, actually what you do is you give yourself to God then he starts helping you choose what to let go of. Yeah. It's like saying, man, I better go get cleaned up because I got to take a bath. It doesn't make any sense. You come to Jesus, you're like, you're all in and then he starts cleaning you up. You can't really do it yourself. This is how you find freedom. And the scripture describes it as admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. <coughs> Notice the phrase here, this word admonishing. You want to say it? It's a fun word to know and say. Admonishing. In the original Greek, it means to warn, counsel, exhort, to give a mild rebuke, you get that? Mild, not harsh. A mild rebuke, Dad. Mild, mild yes. <laughs> a mild rebuke or calling attention to. What we're called to do is call attention to these things that are true, the wisdom of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said that the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth that sets you free, but we find freedom by reminding each other of this truth, by challenging each other, by teaching each other what the truth actually is. This is how Catalyst is set up. Catalyst is our groups based, uh, small group based experience where it's intentional moving you forward in discipleship and, and leadership. And there's a process there that's so good for every one of us. And we're discovering the truth of Jesus, of who he is in your life. Now, Catalyst will not make you a disciple, but it just might be a catalyst right. to becoming a disciple. See what I did there? Yeah. Yeah. 
Because you can't, you can't do any program and expect for it to come out on the other end and get a little certificate. Oh, you're a disciple. Oh, nice job. No, it's, it's deeper than that. There's something more than that. Here's an example of the truth and wisdom of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. Did you know he said this? No guarantees for Ross's church, but he said, I will build my church, right? But isn't it interesting that he told us to do something different? What did he tell us to do? He, he told you and me, he told his disciples and you and me not to build a church, but to go and make disciples. That's in Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. So he builds the church and we make disciples. See, in our modern day American culture, we kind of like building the church. Especially with like, as we keep launching these campuses, it's like people want to get involved. Ooh, I just love starting things. Great. I want to build the church. No, Jesus actually is the one in charge of the church. He has the authority and the wisdom to build it the way it needs to be built. What he needs you to do is make disciples. But we're intimidated by that. See, we said, I want to build the church and hope that Jesus makes some disciples. Because that's hard. That's messy. That means I got to get like all involved in other people's lives. <laughs> I got enough problems of my own. How can I? Don't listen to the lie. You're called to find freedom with others. You got to take that step. And you can't do it by yourself. Teaching other people to obey doesn't mean just talking about it either. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean telling, there's this phrase. He says, teaching, he says, teaching each other to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. Now, here's what we do. We just tell people what they should obey rather than show them how. We got to show each other how. We got to model this thing. It's like, it's like this this idea, and I've, you, you might have heard me talk about this before. It's like, it's like my kids and teaching them to brush their teeth. I have five kids. I went through all of them teaching them to brush their teeth. And what happens? Every single night. Did you brush your teeth? Yes. <laughs> Let me see. Nope. Get back in there and brush your teeth. You're lying. You just made your toothbrush wet. <laughs> they get, we get back in there, and listen, I can threaten them with a big needle from a dentist. I was like, you're going to get the biggest needle right in your gums. It's going to hurt so bad. I can threaten them. I can inspire them with great discussions about white teeth and healthy teeth. They don't care. So I got to get in the bathroom every night, and I got to get, let me see. Nope, nope, you're not getting, here, let me, let me show you. Here, let me hold it. You feel that? Feel that right there? That, you got to get all the way back there. That's what you got to do. <laughs> and then the next night, I got to go through all the same routine again. At first, I thought there was something really wrong with my kids. <laughs> but the truth is, the truth is, this is how it works. We have to be shown there has to be this modeling of life with Jesus. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it by yourself. We can't find freedom without being in community. Look at Galatians 5, 13 through 14. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So you're called to freedom. It's your birthright in Jesus. But he says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Relationship's another big idea that we say around here a lot. And it is, it is in the context of small groups of friends where we work out the issues of our lives. Our paradigms are shifted and where love in that community starts to set us free. You know you're loved. You know you're accepted by the people around you. It convinces you God might be accepting you and love, loving you. See, relationships are the method and the measurement for spiritual freedom. Yeah, now get it, get it, get what I'm saying here. 
The way you get free is by participating in a vulnerable group of people that know your junk and they're willing to walk with you. You get it from in here to out here. Are you with me? In here, bad. Out here, ah, we can work with it. (laughs) There's a small group where you're allowed to be who you are, but loved and loved so much, people are gonna walk with you to try to see freedom come to your life. You need that, I need that, we all need it. So it's the method, but it's also, check this out, this verse just, and several others, it's the measurement by which you have spiritual freedom. We measure spiritual freedom by how you treat people. You're mean and angry to people all the time, you're not free, something's got you. You mistreat people all the time, you don't have freedom. You're full of selfishness. Greed, something's got you. The way you treat people determines your spiritual freedom. The third step is discovering purpose. You have to discover your purpose. Look at the scripture that Paul writes here. He says, so that we may present everyone fully mature. Everybody say mature. Mature. (laughs) I know. Me (laughs) sure. Fully mature in Christ. We're presenting everyone. The idea that Paul is communicating here is encouraging every person is on a journey of maturity. Now, here, here's what you have to ask. You have to ask this question. What does maturity look like? Because I've seen people who've been Christians for a long time, but they're emotionally immature. What does maturity look like? I think maturity could be defined as accepting your life purpose. Accepting your life purpose is about discovering why you're here. Mature people accept the responsibility of their life purpose, of discovering their purpose, of engaging in their purpose. But immature people live in a perpetual state of irresponsibility and unreliability. They become rash and reckless, capricious and and careless. Capricious, good word. Because what is a person without a purpose? Are you guys still with me? Just stay with me a few more minutes, okay? It's okay. (laughs) What is a person without purpose? Listless, meandering, without direction, without meaning, without conviction, without courage, and without empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Just trying to get what you can when you can get it. Miles Monroe said in his book, In Pursuit of Purpose, he says, Without purpose, life is an experiment or a haphazard journey that results in frustration, disappointment, and failure. Without purpose, life is subjective or it is a trial and error game that is ruled by environmental influences and the circumstances of the moment. I don't think anything describes our culture as well as that last sentence. Being ruled by environmental influences and the circumstances of the moment. That's the world we live in, people. And that's why you have to understand a person without purpose will end up being selfish instead of selfless, consumed instead of connected. They'll end up being foolish instead of faithful. And you and I have a purpose. We have a mission. We have a mission that we have to embrace that God himself has given us. We got to come to terms with it. You have a purpose, and your purpose has to do with others. Your purpose is not just about you. It's about others. Look what Jesus said in John 15, 11 through 12. He says, I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be, in your, be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. Mature people live for others. I love how he he sandwiches purpose in this little passage with maturity and love for people. Seasoned people have settled that God's love flows through them to others. This is why we must discover our purpose. There's a whole semester devoted to discovering your purpose in Catalyst. But more than that, there are teams all over this church where people are 
learning about their gifts, where they're discovering what God gave them to do, and they're part of this church, and they're using those gifts, and something is happening to them. There's a maturing that's happening to them because they've decided they're going to surrender to their purpose for the sake of God's calling on our church family. And I think very often you, you think of Team One as something that really committed people do. Could I just challenge you as your pastor that serving other people is one of the steps you got to take? That discovery of your purpose to give your life away Amen. is part of the maturing process of your spiritual life. It's a way that you need to move that causes growth and strength. And honestly, if this is your church home, if this is your church family, you have to find a place where you're gonna be part of the purpose. Because if all you do is come in here and sit and listen to this awesome, amazing message, <laughs> if all you do is sit week to week, but you never do, you never go, you never serve, you never take care of other people, you will become weak spiritually. You'll become lazy. We have to face that. I know. I know what the excuse is. I'm, so, I'm just so busy. I'm just... Listen, everybody's busy. I don't know if you've heard about this thing. It's called the, the clock. Everybody has the same amount of time. It's our priorities that matter. It's whether or not we're going to go on a journey with God to discover our purpose or make a difference. And here's what I believe, all right? Here's, I'm going I'm to I'm encapsulate this idea for you. The church, Big C Church, not just one chapel, but the church is part of God's purpose. Everybody say purpose. It's part of God's purpose on the earth. So you need to get involved in it. The mission is before us. It's everywhere in our city. And that leads us to step four, which is make a difference. You are wired up to make a difference. It's inside your soul in the very makeup of humanity, the desire to make a difference. It is a sense of fulfillment and power that comes into your life. And I want you to notice what Paul says. He says, to this end, I strenuously contend. Check this out. You're still with me, right? We're almost done. I strenuously contend with all of my strength to try to do what God wants me to do. <laughs> That's not what he said. What does he say? To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. You want Christ to work in you? Find a way to make a difference. The, the, the energy that you need is found in Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is this movement to make a difference. It is the willingness to put puzzles together so you can talk about Jesus that something happens on the inside of you. This is what we're called to, but no, I'm too busy. I'm just, I'm just, I got too much to do. It's really hard. <laughs> so hard. Listen, here's what we're fighting. You're in a culture that is individualized. It's all about you. Marketing comes to your doorstep in every way imaginable. Through your phone, through your mail, through your house, through your email, everything is marketed. You're the most important, your decisions, you, what you need. You need more of this, you need new and improved, you need this. You and I have to fight against that and choose to make a difference in somebody else. To look beyond our own needs and be willing to embrace what God is doing in other people. Because listen, this is what you're called to. God's design is that you will be part of a group that makes a difference. Now, some people, they want to make a difference, but they want to do it by themselves. They want to just do it all the I just want, I have this, I have this burden, I have this thing. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to do it on my own. And then they get burned out because they don't have any help. Or worse, they get mad at all the people that won't help them. 
You ever met a person like that? Not fun to be with. <laughs> on, the other side, on the other side, people want to be part of a group. Oh, I want to be part of a group. Oh, that sounds really good. I need to be part of a group. But then they don't want to make a difference in other people's lives because all the arrows are pointing in. I just need this group. And then the, all, all the pull of every group at one chapel is always in. Like, ooh, we got this group. This, I love these people. I love my group. I don't want anybody else to come to my group. <laughs> A group like that will destroy itself. And I'm not, listen, don't take, don't take the extremes of this. There's times when you need to be part of a group and it's safe and there's vulnerability there. Sometimes that's what you need. But honestly, at some point, you're going to have to lift your head and look to others. Because God's purpose that he's put in you is about others, to make a difference in others. And if you want the energy of Christ living in your life, you have to be willing to be about his purpose. What the difference that he makes. Don't work in your own strength. Work in the strength that Christ has. This is the secret to sharing Christ with others. It's the secret to telling your story. It's the secret to living out the gospel in your neighborhood. It's the secret to being on mission with Jesus. Close your eyes, bow your head. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you about this. Our final act of worship is coming to the Lord's table, and it's appropriate that we would come to this table because at this table right here is all the power you need. Would you come and, and would you confess any of your sin, any of the way that you've missed it? Would you, would you come and, and unload yourself of the selfishness that you've been consumed by, and would you, in its place, receive the love of Christ for you and for others? Would you receive his healing? Would you receive your forgiveness here at this table because the bread represents his body broken for your healing, and the cup represents his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins to give you a brand new start? Would you come? to this place and would you receive from him so that he can work through you father it's in your name that i pray this over our time together that there would be an awakening in our hearts and our souls that we would not be sucked into the the way of our culture but that we would live with an understanding you've called us to to these steps to move forward with you. Father, I pray that you would forgive us, heal us, transform us, and give us the energy we need to go forward. In Jesus' name, I pray.